All right. Hey, everyone. This is Keith or Sebastian SB. I'm here with Jesse Miller, someone who wants to try Let's Playing. And I figured we, we actually got questions from a few different people, but one of them isn't here yet. Might show up later. Just asking how to get started or what to do. And I figured I'd just do that as a call and try to make a video out of that just sort of as a catch all, you know, question answer thing. Because I will totally get these same questions next month from different people. <laughs> so it's, it's probably a good idea to make like a standard video out of it. And we're both, we both have our pop microphones, our, our uh, pop filters set up and covering the bottoms of our faces. So we could be speaking a completely different language. You could overdub this and no one would be able to tell. <laughs> so, this, uh, apparently this video is brought to you by Blue Microphones. These are the Yeti and Snowball brands. <laughs> yep, yep. So is there anything where you wanted to start? Um, no, I kind of made a list earlier today. Uh, let's see. Uh, thumbnails. What can you recommend on a program to use for thumbnails or any help um, you can give with that? My go-to is GIMP because it's free. I hated it for a good three months because I'd previously used Photoshop, but I didn't have a copy of Photoshop. And hmm. uh, GIMP has a weird, a few weird finicky things about how it functions, particularly like uh, weird differences. Like in Photoshop, if you use the move tool to like move anything ever, it moves that whole layer, but in a GIMP, it moves whatever you click on, regardless of what layer you're selected. And like, there's just weird differences like that. But it's free, completely functional. Uh, my the go-to for thumbnails really is like, if you're really lucky, you might have you either know a graphic artist or you are a graphic artist, so you can make your own <laughs> unique art. Because that's if you look at Wanderbot's channel, that's just massive amounts of like clean vector art that catches your eye and everything but if you're like me you probably use video game screenshots or concept art and stuff like that i think the, the two the most important things for a uh thumbnail is yeah, you need to you need to be very clearly recognizable it's like generally like probably have the name of the game in there some sort of like episode number usually some branding of some kind like i have my little cartoon character i put on there actually based on i based the whole concept on a on jessa's channel where she just she just flat out has her, her name on the side of her thumbnails for every single video and it's something that's recognizable game grumps has their two little cartoon heads and their weird sort of polka dot background like something that makes it so people can tell which what channel the videos are coming from because otherwise you're at risk of putting up thumbnails and it's like they can tell exactly what game that is it's lost on the weird homepage of YouTube, though, so like they don't know, they don't they can't differentiate it from the other thirty people they're subscribed to right now. Because I've been to the profiles of some people that that subscribe to me sometimes, and I see that like they've subscribed to three people in the last hour, and they've been doing that for the last three weeks or so. Uh, oh, so wow. there's a lot of trying to differentiate yourselves and being recognizable. You want more than anything to just have like a clear subject, though. Something needs to be eye catching. And so a lot of people make the mistake of picking some random screenshot that looks kind of nice, but then putting it in a thumbnail, it's just kind of a noise of textures and details. And there's no clear, like you usually want a subject, like a character in the middle of the screen or something that like a relic or like, like the Dragon Age Trespasser one I did is the big bold title of the, of the game and the DLC name. And then you have that helmet of the Inquisition and like you actually have something in center frame that's recognizable. The, the, probably the worst thing you can do for thumbnails right now, which I see nonstop on the subreddit for Let's Play, is that uh, people take screenshots from their modern video games and they upload those as their thumbnails. But undoctored screenshots from most modern games are weird brown dark images because everything has like some sort of in-game lighting system. Stuff doesn't look like a... Uh, Video games don't look like the Nintendo 64 anymore, where you could just clearly make out everything on the screen all the time. So if you take an unmoving screenshot and just throw it on there, you get a weird brown mess that when it's shrunk down to a tiny screen, like at the very least, you can go into GIMP or you can go into Earth and View or these different image editing softwares. And you can usually like have it auto adjust the contrast or something so that, or do it manually just so you can actually tell what's in the image that you're trying to show people. So that was a lot of questions that I answered that weren't asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is there any issues with copywriting if you're doing screenshots of the game itself? Not really, no. Okay. I've never heard of anyone going being sought after for using game art, especially since a lot of the most commonly used images for uh, 
screenshots are often press release images. Because if you're if you're just looking up uh, if you're looking if you're doing like a Google image search of a video game, unless there's some sort of obnoxious meme involving that game, it's usually actually the images that were released by the publisher for use in press materials in the first place. Because those are the most uh, commonly used, and those are the ones you'll see on uh, Destructoid and Polygon and everyone who gets any sort of advanced copies. And then that that make that I think that probably immediately makes them the top search results on Google as a result. And all the other, other, all the other image res results are actually other people's thumbnails, which <laughs> with their branding and their little time code and stuff. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so what's the big constraint with the copyrights then? Is it just mostly music then? Music, and more recently, this wasn't true for like the first two years I did this, but it's been true for like the last year, year and a half or so. There's a lot of uh, visual content gets copyrighted. So basically. Video game publishers have started to co uh, put out copyright for uh, their cutscenes, basically. Mm, and it okay. used to just be pre-rendered cutscenes because those were on someone's reel, basically. Like the company that made the pre-rendered cutscene, that's usually not actually the part of the company that made the game. Like Blizzard famously uses some company to make all their amazing cutscenes that they do for their like pre-roll advertisements for all their games that is not an in-house thing. Like those companies always pretty much did that because it was their like one thing they made that month so it's like they'd they'd copyright the shit out of it on everything but uh nowadays like i put out devil may cry videos for example uh mm -hmm. several songs in that game uh disable monetization because of copyright almost every cutscene in that game actually gets a copyright match uh nintendo games are notorious for putting uh copyright content id matches out for basically every sound effect and cutscene that's static at any point in the entire game basically and so the, wow. the, the, the noteworthy thing here is that uh, most content ID things don't really have negative repercussions for your account what they do is they just disable mon monetization on that video or in many cases they take monetization and they use it themselves like Nintendo will advertise on your videos and it'll just be all theirs as far as any money that comes from that which is why people like Let's Play, which is the Achievement Hunter channel, just don't generally play Nintendo games. And why you get this... Like, Nintendo games are, in many cases, like actually massively popular. But you get this almost like a false impression that no one cares about them because everyone who covers games doesn't want to touch them because of their policies like that. And Capcom is getting just about as bad as that. And WB is really bad about that. Any Batman... Uh, Shadow of Mordor. <laughs> Basically, uh, Dying Light, I think, too. Like, yeah, every WB published game I've played so far has had, like, this cutscene's copyright by us. We'll be taking that now. And that's just the ongoing trend there. But yeah, so music's they, the biggest one. So they notify you then when they're going to take your monetization? Uh, it, it's, it's completely automated. So, like, oh, they don't okay. even know that your videos exist, basically. It's just you get a, you get a, a little... You usually get an email about it that's automated from YouTube, and then the video itself will say content ID match it's mentioned somewhere in there. Uh, there's multiple kinds of matches. There's some where they don't care, and it'd be like, we recognize that this person thing was made by this person, and like that it just acknowledges that and doesn't do anything about it. Other times it'll say that uh, uh, you, the video is still playable, but ads may be played alongside it and stuff, which is basically them saying that they t they've taken charge of it. And other times, in the worst case scenario, like Frank Sinatra being in the, in the intro of, uh, of Arkham Knight, is that it'll say it's disabled in either all countries or, much more commonly, Germany. Because Germany has weird copyright issues with music where if you get content, if you get, if you get a copyright strike with any music, basically, it's almost always something that you're not allowed to play in Germany. And that's mm. a question I don't have the answer for, but it's definitely <laughs> observable. And a problem for me, because like 15% of my audience is from Germany, according to stats. So that that was incentive for me to use the uh, music removal tool on the first episode of Arkham Knight, where you just hear mostly silence during that, that weird intro scene, followed by like really like weird intersperses of half a second of, of not completely removed Frank Sinatra. <laughs> that was the only way to make the, the video playable for a chunk of my audience. Okay. And, Interesting. 
the surprise about music too is that more music is copyright uh more of it's more of it is likely to be detected in that capacity than you'd expect like it's not just like the latest britney spears song or weezer or whatever it's like that one atmospheric sound you hear in part of fallout 3 like fallout hmm. 3 i removed as pe- i'm somewhat notorious at this point removed uh the, the set the world on fire song but like three seconds later a different sound effect triggered a content id st- uh, match anyway that wasn't any sort of recognizable song because video games basically have non-stop music playing and it's kind of just up to whether or not they decide to flag that stuff wow that's crazy <laughs> it's a minefield out there that's i think that's I believe that's one of the primary reasons why a lot of people join networks. I think networks often kind of take care of content ID claims. They sort of assume responsibility and actually kind of deflect them. The problem is that the uh, the benefits of a, ne- a network are pretty negligible if it's not your like full-time job and you're huge and everything. Because they mostly just take a ton of your money and do nothing to promote your channel. And <laughs> they 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 basically don't know you exist. It's actually, they're actually pretty predatory and gross about it. Jeez. So, unless you're a huge channel, it sounds like those are there's no real benefit to having a network then. Yeah, more or less. Because hmm. if, if you're larger, you're actually making some significant money per video. So having those random strikes is probably a big deal for them. But I can't speak from their perspective necessarily. It's just what I assume because I think every big channel I've heard of is part of some sort of network, like full screen or maker or something curse okay let's see um any suggestions on how to find my voice on how to find your voice talk a lot (laughs) (laughs) it's 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 practice everyone's cringeworthy and awkward and stilted for a while basically unless they come into it naturally the one of the easiest ways around that might be collaborations uh my i my history was i started in 2011 as a two-person channel and we pretty much exclusively made two-person content for a very long time a lot of it's still really bad even at the beginning but you have when you have someone to talk to it can help you figure out what to do i remember uh like a ye- I want to say a year or so into doing that channel, we started doing some solo content during one of the summers. That's actually my I actually did like a 16 episode Dark Souls one playthrough, and I kind of hated it. <laughs> I was not into sitting alone in a room talking to a video game because it was so different from the way that I'd done it before. But at some point, I don't know. It just kind of comes naturally. It's it's definitely it's definitely a lot of practice, and it definitely helps to play a game that gives you a lot to talk about. It's so like for me, I had a lot at that point. I had a lot of experience with Dark Souls, the first game, and so the first thing I did on my channel is I played Demon Souls, which was this perfect mix of this thing is all new to me, but it's also all familiar to me. So I I'm familiar. With, I understand what I'm doing, and I'm talking about a bunch of stuff because I plan to go off of. But also, I'm constantly reacting to the fact that the game is just throwing things at me and just weird stuff's happening. Uh, I think horror games are also handy. Playing something like Outlast or Amnesia is a very easy way to get reactions out of yourself so that you say things because they are inherently reactive games. And that might help people start saying things in videos and figure out how they even want to talk to people because in those games, you're constantly having things that you're reacting to and frankly silences are almost welcome sometimes because it's a moment of just tension in the video so it can actually kind of overcome any the the, the forced scare reactions not i mean forced as in like you're forcing it but as in the game's forcing you to react mixed with the the total okayness of not making noise for a little while because of the tone of the game probably helps uh shield some shortcomings someone might have when they're when they're first starting out and then they can move on to other stuff. Definitely worth practicing. And it's definitely always worth considering that because it's not live, you can always just not continue with something and not upload it. If you if you start it and then realize 
this isn't going great. Maybe I'll start over or maybe I'll try another game altogether. That makes perfect sense. All right. Um, so do you treat this as fun or business? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely just fun for like three years because for the entirety of my time where it was only sad games, it was just something I did with a friend of mine. And for like the first year of doing this, it was just something I did in my free time as shown by the fact that I did like one or two videos per day and that was it basically. And sometimes we just miss days for a while because whatever. Uh, for the last year or so after I got in the one or two thousand subscribers range and started having people subscribe to me that have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and started getting gung ho into like, no, we're going to actually play really long stuff now. Like it was one thing to be like, oh, I'm going to do a Dark Souls 2 video every day for like two and a half months until it's finally over because that's basically how long it took. And that was the whole time I was playing Dark Souls uh, 2, I was doing one video per day and that was the only game I was playing. But after like time passed for a while and suddenly it's like, no, we're doing Legend of Grimrock 2 now and we're doing Dragon Age Inquisition and these are like, that's like a 50 episode game and that's a 128 episode game. and Witcher is like a hundred plus episode game. Suddenly I'm playing these massive games while also not wanting that to be the only thing on my channel like it once was. And so at some point, if you're trying to do long shows or do multiple concurrent shows and be active and doing that forever, you can't just be like casual and do it whenever you feel like it about it anymore. Cause otherwise it becomes impossible. Basically you start you you would just be you'd be what you'd be what most uh let's play channels i see when i go to the let's play subreddit and see all these new people starting out is you see the first four episodes of a lot of games on their channel and nothing ever gets finished because they're always getting distracted by the new thing they want to play and i definitely have some of that of like oh god i've got to get on this thing that i definitely want to play on the channel that came out today but i'm also trying to finish the other things so there's a whole lot of uh scheduling and drawing on a whiteboard or google uh google calendar and stuff like that of like having checklists of like these are the three things i'm trying to record today these are the games that have gone the longest without the most recent episode and like having you have to be like regimented about it to some extent and kind of treat it like a job just to make it work properly all right uh, what methods would you recommend uh for promoting your channel uh i gave up on promoting my channel, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, okay. If you go on, on the subreddit, which I'll keep referring to just because it's my primary exposure to other Let's Players, everyone talks about promoting, and a lot of these people really struggle to get any real results. And by and large, they usually get really negative feedback and people just kind of breaking their will because they'll, they'll get swamped by people who hate their channel because they promoted on the wrong subreddit or something like that. Uh, there's some Twitter methods people use that I kind of find to be on the borderline of spammy. Spammy on a good side and on the bad side, like on the well, the, well, the less, the, the more bad side, almost like scummy and gross where people are actively going out and reaching out to people and tr trying to trick them into following them ba based on completely insincere messages, basically. Like trying, just sort of reaching out and trying to act like you're having conversations with people. Kind of, it's like, uh, a common thing I see as a let's player is I see people come to my channel and say, "Wow, this is a great video. You should come out. You should come check out my let's play of this video." And I'm like, "You didn't. You didn't watch this video. You didn't randomly come by and watch episode 78 of Dragon Age Inquisition. So, no, you're just you're promoting your own stuff. And I know you're doing that because you instantly you were in my spam filter when I found you. So other people already flagged you for spam doing this thing you're doing. But uh, I kind of have the thought the thought process that uh. Everyone has a Let's Play channel. No one wants to hear about your Let's Play channel. The people looking for your Let's Play channel and that will find your Let's Play channel are the ones that want to know about it. But if you just go f putting it out on places constantly, you're going to mostly find the people that don't want to hear about it. And they're sick of hearing everyone about how, you know, everyone's banned. Uh, like everyone has their band. They're trying to give out their CDs. If I go to, the, if I go to this, my cousin's birthday party, I can give everyone there a CD and maybe people will know my band exists and stuff like that. And it's like, you can't just force this kind of stuff on people. It doesn't really work. The exception being uh, 
the let's the type of let's play content that is successful on those kinds of sites is the highlight videos the specifically like people like toxic doctor pewdiepie markiplier jack septic i is that i think that's what that spelled i can't <laughs> i'm trying to remember it but like people who make like really rapidly edited like five minute videos that are a bunch of moments cut together and not a let's play no one wants it's really hard to just share on a forum your 100 hour series on an rpg as compared to the uh the five minute uh like jump scares and funny things happening videos basically i'd basically say that yeah basically there's total it's totally possible to do long form content on youtube but the the uh, stereotypical attention span of the internet totally applies the moment you're trying to share it outside of YouTube to websites, especially since like all the most popular uh, websites people like to promote on in the first place are places like Facebook, where people just look at a 30 second video for a moment, uh, Twitter, more or less the same thing, and Reddit. Like er everyone that goes on Reddit, you're looking at you're looking at. Uh, like funny images with captions and short form videos, basically. You don't really find on the front page of Reddit a 45 minute video about anything. It's like, it, 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 so it's the, I'd say basically my advice fits for people that do the content I do, but people that do completely different content could be more applicable to different types of uh, self promotion that I don't do. But my main strategy is just to, Make an entire let's play of the game and have a description that has keywords in it, basically. Like usually the description from oftentimes Wikipedia or Steam of the game. Uh, be careful about picking keywords for the tags. And as you've, as you've probably seen from my video titles, uh, unless I'm playing something that's like... Uh, basically like Outlast, basically. Like that's one game where I was just like, ah, let's just come up with titles that are related to... What happened in the video that are just sometimes just kind of funny lines or something but most of the channels basically this is the name of the quest and this is the name of this mission and i think jeffrey perry just showed up i did i'm there sorry he is. sorry i dragged this window open long story short i had some personal stuff i had to take care of before we could do all this so i apologize for not getting to you guys uh you know it slipped my mind with everything so i apologize profusely about this i really do it's fine. I just I just had to get started because I have, I have a lot of things to do. <laughs> right. No, I get it. I get it. It's fine. Um, so, I mean, what were we? What is the topic of discussion as of right now? Uh, Jesse was asking how I promote my videos, basically, and I kind of just came to the conclusion that I don't, and that it's kind of more friendly to highlight uh, highlight heavy content, but for people who make. Uh, longer form of content, it's kind of less shareable, and you kind of have to rely more on people finding it, which kind of right. amounts to SEO. So basically, uh, descriptions and tags that are related to what to the the game, and and specifically thinking about what people might search for if they're trying to find content on this game, and try to put those types of tags in your in your videos, and perhaps most importantly, I as far as I can tell, titles are the single most impactful thing on search results on YouTube. And so what that means, it, that if you look at my channel, you see like all these RPG videos where the names of videos are the quest names and boss fight names and places where I find items if they're static items, like in Dark Souls games where there's 500 hidden items that only exist in one chest in an obscure corner of the map. And like you put that in the name of your video, suddenly it's a, a top search result. Like weirdly enough, in Dark Souls 2, one of my top search results for a while was... Uh, Felicia the Brave, which is just a weird, obscure character you can summon in a hut in one part of near the end of the game. And like, just weirdly specific things that if you're the only person who has that tag in your title on YouTube, suddenly mm. that's a place where people can find you. I see. Okay. So instead of making... I mean, I, I believe it was your post that I read earlier that was basically saying, like, you would rather want more specific tags and stuff than you would... Um, for for specific things and having search for that as opposed to broad tags and stuff like that. So yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's all about really specific results that people can find things. Like obviously, you want the most broad tags possible, and in, in that you want the game name because you can't skip that step. But uh, after that, uh, 
the, the more you use broad tags, the more competition you have for the same tags. And that, and that competition usually comes in the form of larger YouTubers with higher audience retention and therefore better search ranking. And so for you guys using the same tags as each other, they're going to win. But you can use a lot of more obscure things that will come up when people are, say, looking up how to get through some specific part of the game or find something they haven't been able to find. And then hopefully they stick around after they find your video. Right. Like a, probably a good example is a uh, right now I'm doing really well, at least comparatively well with uh, the new Shovel Knight expansion, and like there's one there's one thing which is that the game itself is called Shovel Knight. I then I put the the colon and uh, was it Plague of Shadows or something, <laughs> whatever the yeah, expansion yeah. is called, and conveniently enough the game's called Shovel Knight and that has Plague in the subtitle. So Plague Knight's already in the title without me even adding it specifically. But then I also add a, uh, in the first video I went, I made sure to actually t show people how to use the cheat code to unlock uh, Plague Knight, which gave me an excuse to put like Plague Knight unlock code or something like that in the title of the first video. And just like that, that video is one of the, like, I think the most viewed, actually, I think I actually got a pop up on my dashboard saying it's the the fa the fastest it's the most viewed video in two days i believe in the last six months of my channel wow just by getting wow. the like exact stat people exact things people might look up and also in this case covering something that a lot of people will just ignore which is often weird expansions to games after people stop looking at them <laughs> right yeah like that's probably what happened with uh dark souls 2 like I got some activity when Dark Souls 2 first came out, and that was fine. But I got my bigger spikes when I was there day one for the third DLC, when at that point a lot of people were probably paying less attention as far as people that make content. And I got a I got the biggest boost in the history of my channel by playing the re-release of the game and doing videos for that, where a whole lot of people that aren't straight-up Dark Souls YouTubers probably didn't bother let's playing the game again when it had a new semicolon and a subtitle. I see. Okay. Did you have, did you have any new questions, Jeffrey? Um, I, I guess uh, one thing that comes. I mean, I don't have um. I left my note anyway. Uh, one of the questions that sort of comes to mind right now is: Do you think that more AAA games are kind of harder to start with? Uh, with Let's Play as opposed to some obscure uh, indie or lesser known titles. Uh, especially, you know, uh, indie games and stuff. Do you feel like there's a stark difference between using the two as Let's Plays? Um, probably. Basically, uh, how do I put this? AAA content has the biggest opportunity for growth, but the highest competition. So crazy dumb luck can happen the way that it kind of happened with me in Scholar of the First Sin. But... For every one of those, there's several games where, like, I basically made a rule for myself to stop playing games published by WB because Batman and Dying Light and Shadow of Mordor all fell completely flat as far as views goes because they I, they just did not bring in anyone new. But on the other I hand, see. I get a ton of people saying that they found me via Legend of Grimrock 2, like a $24 game on Steam, I think. And uh, Talos Principle, which is like a $30 game from the people that make Serious Sam. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I think I'm still like all, almost all the search results for the game called uh, Ulysid. No, Euclidean. I, I always want to say Ulysid. Uh, Euclidean, that game, uh, some game where you are falling through the abyss of some sort of Cthulhu style end of sanity situation. And it's like I played it for like an hour and put it up as four videos. And if you look up that video, like, let's play Euclidean, I'm still, like, the entire front page of results, practically. And that happens wow. a lot. Like, uh, one, of the, one of the big things is just being able... If you get if you go fully obscure, especially, like, you go to websites like, like uh, dudedistribute.com and stuff like that, and you browse through there, and you, get, you try to find people who are still trying to share their games, especially if they haven't come out yet, you can potentially get codes for things that aren't out yet and might not even have an embargo date and it's just no one else has covered it yet and then suddenly the game you can you can play it put out a bunch of content for the game then it comes out a week later 
and suddenly everyone's looking up this game they see on their Steam dashboard that they don't know what it is, and you could be potentially a lot of the top results for it. But even if you're not ahead of the schedule, just co even covering games day one, just by going to like to like the front page of Steam and just being like, "What's new on the? What just came out today? All yeah. right, I'm I'm gonna get that right now and just play that." Can actually yeah, might... lead to a lot of results. Yeah, one of the games that I'm actually really excited to start doing a let's play of uh, is a indie game that I that I noticed about uh, maybe a few days after it came out. I try and remember the name. I I think it's uh, Overwhelmed. I think it is what it is. Maybe Underwhelmed. I forget. Um, it's Undertale? essentially like a, it's a yes, yes. That's it. Yeah, Undertale. Um, it was a game that was totally not on our radar, but I did exactly what you just said, where I basically just went to the, the Steam uh, indie games and was looking at what games have come out, what that have positive reviews or somewhat positive reviews, and then this one just sort of popped up and seemed to be like a really cool game. So I'm really excited to actually record that stuff. I think tomorrow is actually when I'm going to start doing that stuff, but um, I think that that's hopefully something that will jumpstart my channel once I get it off the ground and running, but we'll see. Um, it's it's definitely sure. a place to start. Mm -hmm. Def the, the contrast here is that uh, it's, it is definitely the inverse of the AAA where it's way less competition, way easier to be a result that's noticed when people look up anything about that game, but also the ceiling for growth can be way smaller. So, like, right, if you're super lucky, you might be there day one for the next Minecraft or the next uh, Binding of Isaac or something before anyone cares about it that much. But for every game like that, there's a game like Euclidean where I'm still all the search results, but also maybe 200 people have even looked into what that game is in the entire world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so right, the, yeah. it can be a very low ceiling sometimes. <laughs> Really, more than anything, though, it's just persistence. Persistence and actual attention mm -hmm. to detail and quality control and caring about whether or not you're doing it right. Because there's always people on the subreddit saying, I've been doing this for three years and I have 60 subscribers. And it's always like, I look at their channel, I'm like, I know I'm going to see one or more of several things. Either all of their games they're playing are super irrelevant, like they're the, fifth, the 500th person to play Majora's Mask and that's their last three months. Or they have no thumbnails or they have no titles their their titles are just called let's play this game part 1 or something and that's their entire title with nothing extra or distinguishing about it or in many cases and this is real common is just people putting up one video every week or every 3 days or every 2 weeks and maybe they take a month off and then they put up another couple weeks and you find people that say i've been doing this for like 2 years and you look at their channel like they have 60 videos total and they're like 8 to 12 minutes long and it's like well you don't have much content so that's why no one's finding you it's all about oh. casting a real wide net and someone playing one Zelda game for two years is not going to really make a splash right yeah and you post like was it five videos uh, a day out now is that where you're anywhere at? between four and six basically every day okay. I come home from work and like I'm like, which games have have gone the longest since the last video? And uh, I write them down and just start trying to make it down the list as far as I can before I'm just out of time for the day. And it can be anywhere between four and six videos or so. If I'm real lucky, you get cool moments where I'm playing like a game like Life is Strange where I can just use everything. And then you, otherwise you might have moments where I'm playing Super Meat Boy and doing one level for 70 minutes and maybe got a four minute video out of that chunk of the recording and that's probably the number one thing that leads to ver variety there but it's important to be okay with that kind of thing because a lot of people will totally just take the recordings and say cut it every 15 minutes and just say that's their videos and not worry about like maybe that whole hour in the middle was me fighting one boss fight non-stop so it's it's better to have inconsistent output than to have inconsistent quality I see. Okay. I mean, I mean, I hear kind of two different things then is either have inconsistent output, but have high quality. Or, um, if you don't put out enough, if, you, if there's, if you don't meet the threshold of how much you should be putting out, you're also not going to grow your channel at all either. So it sounds like there's this weird fluid kind of middle ground that you have to 
output on a regular basis, but also have high enough quality to where you can sort of justify that much output as well. Absolutely. If you're just going to mass produce content and you're not going to care about any, any editing or quality control, you might as well just cut your just cut it out and just go to Twitch basically and just not bother right. making video on demand. But if you uh, don't make any sort of consistent quality, I mean, any sort of consistent output for your videos, then you're just not going to grow because you're not going to have content. You're not what you can't put out one video like you can't cover one game and then that people go to your channel and they just see like this floating or Korean of time video and like they're, they're not they're not going to stick around. They want they want to see an active channel. They want to see some variety probably or a ton of coverage of that game they love like all those Minecraft channels and Biting of Isaac yeah. channels and stuff. So they, they want to see that you're active and doing something and they want to see that there's more than just that video worth watching. But also, just making more videos gives you more opportunities for the, you to be found because every video could be search results. So not making enough just means that you might be literally invisible to the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can I can definitely see that. Uh, and, for and sure. There's definitely so, a slider uh, going both ways too, because like basically yeah. going super far into the quality, the mass uh, the mass content is obviously streaming, basically, like I said. But then going the full other direction mass like massive editing makes you basically one of those highlight reel channels which mm -hmm. can get away with not making a video every single day they, they can get away with weekly content and stuff like that because they're all about making one really successful video right i get that um i guess i guess if if we're gonna go into I mean, Jesse, if you want to chime in, go ahead. By the way, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Jeff. Um, <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm a bad host. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it, it's totally fine. I jumped in uh, uh, late in the game, so, I mean, introductions were probably uh, no longer on the table. But, um, I mean, I, I guess, uh, I, I guess uh, with this new channel that I am going to be upbringing and everything like that, I'm sort of at this crossroads where i need to look deeper like i know that i want to do let's plays and and make youtube a very much regular thing um it's just trying to figure out how regular that's going to be for me is like what what can i a what can i actually uh realistically uh take time out each week to spend on on this kind of thing and how much output can I get from that? And on top of that, um, what is um, realistic for me to be able to say, this is how much content I'm going to be coming out, and trying to figure out where things sort of balance, where between how much I can realistically come out with and how much I want to have. Because in a perfect world, I would love to have a video a day come out, but I'm just not sure if that's something that's like possible to do at this point. Um, and it, it, I'm kind of worried that I'm shooting myself in the foot because I'm not able to do that or I haven't made the time to make that happen before I started doing the channel. I would say the first biggest step is just actually managing to stick with it in the first place, mm -hmm. which that's the biggest thing I've learned probably from the entire subreddit is just the failure rate of channels, not because of like the channel didn't take off or something, but as in like they just, I mean, failure rate is in like they completely started and then stopped often within the span of like a couple months or something is like a massive percentage of all channels that I've ever encountered basically. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people that uh they go into it just thinking that's this fun wacky thing they can do because they saw a Markiplier do it or something like that and then they realize this these videos don't get that much attention. I don't or I don't instantly have a fan base and this actually takes a fair amount of work and then people just quit right away. So if you can just try to just start and set like analyze what your time is like what how much time you can commit to it or want to commit to it and then try to set a goal for yourself for consistency for the next month or so and then just see if you can hit that or not and then next month adjust your expectations accordingly and just see if you can actually like have a month where you basically set yourself a goal and actually stick to it and can nail it then you not only will you actually be figuring out how to run your channel, but you'll also be figuring out if you want to do this. Right. No, I think that's absolutely 
perfect advice for me uh, as far as like what I need to start doing. Um, because I'm not going to lie. I was actually really like, as soon as I like uploaded my first intro video and basically said, Hey, um, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to try out. But, um, I don't know who just followed me because it didn't show up in my you know, one second, one yeah, Hold on. Um, I'm just trying to grab a, my backpack out from the room and my girlfriend's streaming on Twitch right now. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was trying to basically make it so I could, uh, like, as soon as I put my first intro video up on my channel, basically saying, hey, this is the channel, this is, you know, what's going on. And, and I was really happy with how that video sort of ended up being. Um, but as soon as that happened, I was like, okay, this is a real thing. And then I got anxiety about it because I didn't know um, how to sort of deal with the insecurities that I've got with it and, and basically just be like, hey, I am trying to do this. But like, when you start a channel, especially um, a brand new channel, uh, like first timer and everything like that, um, I think that you put yourself in a very vulnerable situation. Um, for people to see your video and people to sort of uh, find you and stuff, and that you're sort of at this weird point where you aren't known enough to where you have your confidence and um, you have to sort of work to get your fan base and everything like that. So I, it, it, it became real, and it made me anxious, and I've been kind of putting it off because of that, but... Um, hopefully, and I, I know I'm going to continue to try and do it because it's something I've been wanting to do for quite a while and I'm not just going to let a couple of jitters sort of stop me on it, but it definitely was a setback. So, I mean, the, the advice that you've got to sort of make a uh, monthly goal and just sort of stick with that, I think would be perfect advice for me. And be ready for comments. Uh, mm -hmm. Shitty comments, both deserved and undeserved. Uh, right. Because it's it's the it's the it's the worst storm of you're gonna be the worst let's player that you've ever be, that you ever will be basically mm -hmm. like, like at the beginning that's when you're going to suck the most basically and it's up to whether or not people will progress past that not to even say that you actually start out sucking but it's going to be the worst that you'll ever be probably and so you're going to get negative feedback for the content but also gonna get negative feedback because you don't have an audience so when you first right. start out uh. Basically, every time anyone ha encounters your channel, they have a pretty, almost like even split of whether or not they're going to like your content or not like your content. And mm -hmm. a lot of the continued positive feedback you get is actually from people sticking around and continually uh, watching your videos. And that's the, the good thing about people that like your content is they stick around and the people that don't like your content go away, which leads to long-term gains and positivity for overall feedback. But you always have that chance of the shitty people showing up or people that just aren't compatible with the kind of thing you're making. And the problem is that the, uh, at the beginning, they, have a, they make up a way larger portion of the people that will encounter your content in the first place. Right. No, I understand that, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I like to think that I have th thick skin. Uh, and it's all just sort of mental in my mind of, like, I, I can tell, I can deal with people basically saying, hey, you, you suck or whatever. In my mind, I think I, that that's the case. But once it probably happens, it will be a, a different story. But hopefully, I'll be able to sort of persevere through that. But you know, I guess well, the only way I'll know is if uh, I do it enough to get the comment, and then once that happens, I'll figure it out. It's it's an experiment. Uh, still today, like I get a lot of feedback that completely doesn't phase me and then other feedback that i think about for like the next few hours uh okay. and it's a super mixed bag uh oft oftentimes the meaner the comment the more hilarious and dismissible it is and the more like of a complete sentence and of a criticism it is the more you keep thinking about it <laughs> i've okay. gotten like slightly angry at loyal fans because they just so consistently leave feedback and I don't say anything back, but it's like that the comment like drills into the back of your head because they're someone that's been around for a while or in or in some cases, like there was a guy uh, was it? I finally just had to tell this one guy just like just to cut it out at some point because it was a uh, King Rat was this guy who seemed to be marathoning my entire Dragon Age Inquisition series from front to back. And it's like there's a mixed and he was making like he was always making critical comments and sometimes at one point he was even saying like it's it's like you play with blinders on and all these things like that and uh 
I, you have to think back and forth here of like on one hand his comments are shitty but also people have like internet induced like Asperger's syndrome where they <laughs> don't know how to interact with human beings anymore because it's all through text <laughs> on the internet and I have to think about the same time like he is watching like 90 episodes of a long series so he clearly likes it at least on some level because holy crap that's some commitment to just be like i'm gonna make an in-depth moment by moment review of your let's play like he, he they have to be into it to some extent at that point so you kind of have to weigh those things together like if you see someone a lot and they leave shitty comments they probably like your stuff more than they present themselves as doing so because otherwise they wouldn't be around all the time but a lot of people don't know how to say nice things ever. <laughs> and uh, people are always more vocal about things they don't like than things they do. Which is probably why the internet's been like an inherently negative place since I found out about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you edit your comments, right, Keith? Um, I edit out... I, like it, it depends. There's like 99% so of comments never get touched by anything. Hmm. Uh... I have a kind of extensive word filter of a lot of words that I just know of that like people saying this word in basically any context is never a good comment. And so a lot of those words, including misspellings and creative ch attempts to get around misspellings and stuff like that. And like, I'm going to go around the word filter type spellings are all like in my uh, auto, like auto block, uh, filter. Like that doesn't block the account. It, uh, it, it automatically puts the comment up for review, which means that I have to approve it for it to show up on the channel. Uh, if someone leaves a comment that is just flat out, like, insulting to me or another person in, like, a really hostile way, I'll just, I'll just block their comments from the uh, channel altogether. Just, I won't even give a warning if they're being shitty enough about it. And what that, that, what that is, is a, it's a shadow ban. So it's like what happens on, I think, Reddit also, where basically they can still leave comments... And they won't, and they'll even see themselves leave the comment. And if they come back to the page, they can see their comment. But no one else on the entire planet, including me, even knows that they're leaving comments. So like they're banned oh. without knowing they're being banned. I more times than not try to engage people a little bit first and just see if they're, if I can reason with them at all before I deal with them. But most times, uh, if you talk to somebody, they just dig their heels in and get worse and show just how ugly they can be, and that just leads to me banning them anyway. <laughs> But basically, if someone if someone says unforgivably shitty things, I ban them instantly. If someone's just being kind of rude, I try to talk to them. But ultimately, if someone is like, even if they're not being an unreasonable, terrible person, like if they just really, really, really dislike my content and are for some reason sticking around and being vocal about it, I would just kind of get rid of them because I don't want to become... I don't want to end up the way that... Uh, the two biggest two of the channels I watch all the time are Let's Play and Game Grumps, and those comments make you think that everyone hates those channels that are popular because people like them. Like they're <laughs> like it's inherently yeah. self contradicting that all the comments are toxic in a channel that has is covered in likes and gets all that that viewership. Like because they have an audience that loves their stuff, but the comment section is just dominated by awfulness. Like I, I, like Jordy Jordan is has been a semi vocal supporter of some of the like videos I put up here, and he, he loves like the Soma series and the the Grimrock series. How he found me, I believe. And I looked at his comments, and literally the first video I clicked on was was someone saying, "Put." He's basically said like, "Put up a Call of Duty video or kill yourself." <laughs> it's like I don't I don't need that at all. And some of that I get around by the fact that I happen to make content that is. Like, just the right level of boring, basically. My content's dry and long and long and really goddamn long. And playing games that are usually aren't inherently, like, super, like, giggle funny and stuff. So I end up, at least according to analytics especially, attracting a, a older audience. Which is, I'm very happy for. Because if, if, you, if you make a highlight channel or a jump scare channel... You get a lot of teenagers and a lot of children, and as in like literal children who ride the school bus and want to watch an eight minute video on their phone on their way to school. And those are the worst people on the internet to be exposed to as your main as your main <laughs> audience to leave comments. Because they don't even know what the words, they don't even understand the implications of half the words they say. Mm -hmm. And that just leads to them being the most, and also they don't have the part of their brain developed yet that, that controls uh, empathy. 
So they're just little monsters. <laughs> but I got a lot of 25-year-olds and 34-year-olds and lawyers and stuff and people that are doing better than me. <laughs> <laughs> which apparent, which is probably why my Patreon's doing better than some of the other channels I've compared to, which is weird. There are channels with a uh, hundred thousand subscribers that have less Patreon support than I do, and that's not. I'm trying to think about that too hard. <laughs> right. I mean, when did you start? When did you make the jump to to actually do Patreon? Um, like what? Like, are there any were there any guidelines that you had when you were just like, okay, I would like to start doing Patreon now, and here's why I want to do it now, as opposed to when, you know, like, what was sort of the the reason that you finally took the dive into Patreon? I think I used like some sort of arbitrary milestone. I want it might have been five thousand subscribers, but it, that almost sounds no, it could, it probably was four thousand or something like yeah, that. I think it was four. Because if it was 5,000, it would have been too recent. Because I'm get i currently getting about 600 subscribers per month. So that would have been real recent. I'm on like my fourth month of Patreon, I think, right now. Uh, it was arbitrary, kind of. I knew I wanted to do it because I was trying to supplement my income because I have a shitty job that does not really pay me. Especially considering like it's a job I needed a degree to get. Like I went to college and now I'm making about as much money as I did when I worked at Best Buy, but it's supposed to lead somewhere according to the endless carrot on a stick nature of jobs in reality. But Yeah. Uh, same boat, man. Yeah, basically. So uh I was watching I was watching my ad revenue and I was watching the activity and it's basically just like a basic it was basically just a basic uh basic basic basic. It was a <laughs> just a contrast and uh, what am I trying to say? It's a of like a value judgment basically of I need to figure out how my life's going to work at some point because uh, I've, uh, as I've vocalized a few times, basically, it's just it's like kind of a race between my YouTube career and my like my educational career or whatever of like which one of these two things is going to lead to some kind of full time, proper, stable employment that can fund itself where I don't have to do what's basically two jobs. And so I basically was uh, I was happy to just do the YouTube as a side thing at first because for the first year and a half or so I was just an unemployed student well for the first few months I was an unemployed student then I was just unemployed for like a year just hanging out at still living at home and kind of working a side job at my dad's upholstery shop and just kind of hanging out and looking for a job and not finding one and doing YouTube because it was something to do but once I had my actual job taking up a lot of time, I was like, I need to, I need to monetize my time to some extent because the job doesn't make a ton of money and I'm putting all of my free time into YouTube. So I need to figure out how to make some more money off of this to make it all work, like basically work out for me. And ultimately planting the seed of like, if this channel keeps growing and the Patreon keeps growing, then it could be full time. Because mm -hmm. getting people to look at that type of content and look at your Patreon and be willing to look into that stuff, they kind of need to see it in action for a while. And I, I think it's it's always a slow growing thing, faster than I thought it would grow for sure. But uh, just put it, putting it out there early makes it feel normal, so that people like the way the longer you wait, the just the less you'll ultimately get from it, and. Uh, the more suddenly you spring it on a larger audience, the more likely people are just get, going to be outraged about it. I actually lost sleep the night I just launched it, thinking that like people are going to be mad at me for this for some reason, because every large channel actually has really shitty feedback when they launch something like a Patreon account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost as if you were to do a sponsored video, almost. Because I've seen yeah. very similar feedback to, this video is sponsored by blah, 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 and the same as, here's our Patreon uh, very similar comments from what I've read where people are just like, you are already wanting more money. You already are getting YouTube money. Why should I do this? And people get off put by it very quickly. Yeah. So my, my strategy was just to, first of all, I think, I think no one should make a Patreon account unless they hit a point where they feel like they have some, like a situation where the number of people that you know are loyal followers that comment a lot and are like watching your content all the time is a longer is a larger number of people than you can actually list easily like it has to be kind of thing of like oh yeah there's this huge list of people where like if i see their names i'll recognize that that person's been around for like two years and all these things but you can't just like 
come up with a list on the top of your head because there's too many of them to some extent. Mm. Like it has to be a harder number to remember because only a small percentage of those people are going to be the ones that actually come out and support you. And it's, I think that's, I think that having a launching a Patreon to, and have it get no support almost discourages further support. It's like launching a Patreon that no one subscribes to. I think suddenly just people look at that and see, oh, that that page is dead, and they just don't, they don't go any further than that. And my strategy with that account was just to be saying that uh, what what's going to happen here is I'm going to basically give the keys to a few people, but I'm not going to hide content. There's not there's not a Patreon like paywall. It's not a weird exclusive club. It's just there's a, a few different tiers of like the sponsored video, which is the top crazy people that put, give a lot of money to the Patreon can basically say look they, they can look at my rather extensive game list and say play that game for an hour this month. And everyone else basically can collectively vote on what the Patreon series of that month is. So it gives the ability to support me and affect the content on the channel, but also there's not exclusive content, and it also doesn't completely change the course of the entire channel at the whims of some small group of people. So it's like a, right. a happy middle ground, basically. It's actually worked out, I think, because it mostly just means that a uh, more variety shows up on the content on the channel than normally would. Because my channel was kind of based around Splattercat gaming to some extent. Like, not it wasn't even like I hadn't even watched one of his videos yet. I just watched his channel and I'm like, okay, this actually. I looked on Social Blade. I'm like, he's growing pretty all right. I look at the way he's handling things. I'm like, he has. Uh, the thumbnail thing like I noticed that he has a little character on every single thumbnail I'm like that's probably a good idea <laughs> and more than anything though I just observed the games he was playing and I observed that they were all kind of a central theme and so my uh, he he was doing like strategy games or something like that so I focused my channel around RPGs after having already done well with a with the Demon Souls playthrough and uh as a side effect though I've been kind of afraid of variety in content sometimes because I think the more if I ever reach out with something surprising people won't want to watch it which has been proven true multiple times. But the perk of the Patreon system is that uh, by letting people vote on stuff, that that show or episode has an inherent... Uh, they are, It already has an inherent captive audience because they wanted it in the first place and said they wanted it. And I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> it was basically just of like how you... When when you decide to sort of pull the trigger, oh you right, it yeah, way earlier. But uh, th this is it's, still really good stuff. Yeah, it's basically just when you think you have enough people that would actually support it. You could you could even uh, well no, I was gonna say you could put up a video eventually, just being like, would you be people people be interested in this? But I think I did that, and no one said anything. <laughs> so <laughs> even that's not a good indication, because <laughs> people. It's yeah. always a, the the silent people are always a surprise. Yeah, I think that if I, it, you know, if I were to do a Patreon thing, and this is very much down the road. I'm not going to start. Oh a YouTube yeah, channel it's stuff. It's stuff that's almost not even to it's, stuff to think yeah, about I mean, yet. <laughs> it's crossed my mind, um, but basically, just because of everything that I sort of seen before, I think I'm just going to sort of. Um, Put it up on my YouTube and the links on my channel and mention it once or twice once I decide to sort of let it be. And if people start supporting it that way, then great. And if not, maybe push it a little bit more. But um, it won't be something that I'll be in your face about uh, if there ever is a time where I decided to decide to do a Patreon account. It won't ever be something that's sort of in your face because the, I've seen – and write about people that try and do that um, before, and it just sort of ended catastrophically. Yeah, at, whenever you have anything you're trying to get people to go to, like a, a Twitter account, a Twitch account, a Patreon account, and stuff like that, you basically, you want to have, like, ever-present reminders of it. Like, you want to have it visible somewhere as, like, a thing that just kind of crops up every now and then, and... Like like a non-vocal end slate, the way I do it is actually a decent way of doing that, of just being like, here's a little thing. It's like like I have a little credits thing at the very end where I thank some people and there's a link to the Patreon, but it's also just set to some music and not like me going, 
I'm not acting like a video game like comedy reviewer where they're like, I'm going to spend the last two minutes of my eight minute video thanking people out loud and then saying to go to my Patreon account and then check out this other video and stuff like that because that stuff gets old really fast if you're producing the quantity of content that a Let's Player does. Like, mm-hmm. like the same canned sort of obnoxious advertisement of your other things to check out. It's almost, it's, almost, it's almost worse when people already have supported those things or are following those things and you won't stop telling them about them. But yeah, this is all stuff like networks and Patreon accounts and stuff like that are all stuff to think about well down the road for sure because you just have yeah. to figure out if you're going to still be here three months after you start. Yeah, and that's the scary part. Mm-hmm. It's just how how short-term things really really should be when you first start out because you don't know if you're going to want to do this you know, you know, a month or two down the road and everything. And I'm trying to sort of keep that mindset as opposed to just – uh, you know, get, being given an inch and taking a mile when I first started the channel. But, you know, I've got long-term goals and I've got short-term goals, but um, I should probably focus more on the short-term than anything. But, um, you know, that's just me. Yeah, like going through, like what immediately, like I, I've been doing this for four years because of the other channel, but I started this specific channel two years ago almost, and like my sixth video or something like that was a Gary's Mod collaboration with Wanderbot and a few other people. And I'm thinking of all the people from my collaboration group just in general, like just trying to even think of like a list here. Like basically Wanderbot is the one person out of all of them that is a person like me where they're sticking to a consistent output and also getting results and it's going somewhere and they're like actually growing at a significant rate. And then there's a handful of people that are still around. They maybe took breaks here and there or were inactive for a long time, but are kind of currently back, but they haven't necessarily taken off in any significant way, which is like uh, Radian Gaming, Jam Scanner, uh, Bird Catcher, maybe Agent Core. Like, I think he might be gone now, actually. But then the list of people that have completely gone, like I can just keep going because there's there's Crafty Gnomes, there's Lost Spider, there's Thousand Colors, there's Boris, there's TLE on the internet, there's uh, Roxarian, I might be dead or active. Rock War is definitely pretty much dead. Like, I can, just from people I've collaborated with myself, the list of people that are not doing this anymore, or make one super occasional video but mostly don't really commit to it at all, like, is actually like a kind of staggering number. And those are people that I bothered to interact with, as opposed to the countless people that I won't touch like all the the 14 year olds playing Minecraft that don't have capture cards and use cameras pointed at screens yeah do you have any other questions Jesse we haven't gotten back to you for a while oh um how about uh archiving um would you recommend archiving each piece uh Kind of like how you have it set up, or do you just care about the final product? Archiving. Oh, uh, you mean the, the original recordings? Yes. Uh, I think at some point it kind of becomes unfeasible. Uh, like, my hard drive... I have a, I have the one terabyte hard drive that I started with, and then I added a four terabyte hard drive, and recording hours of content every day you definitely can't keep the source videos at some point. Like, it's not reasonable. Uh, and at some point, even the rendered videos are way too big. You could potentially throw them through something like Handbrake to compress them, but once you start producing a certain level of content, it'll you, you more or less hit a point where you're not going to be able to keep the original videos around unless you specifically start, uh, like, buying new hard drives to store them on, basically. <laughs> At some point, it will become too much. And at some point, you almost have to wonder, like, is our Let's Plays disposable enough that you don't necessarily need to keep every video ever? Like, if a storm happened and I lost some content, would it ultimately be that worth the hassle to have kept a copy forever? Or can, Rogue Le- or can my Rogue Legacy series just kind of go on being forgotten? And I could just make more, potentially. It's kind of tough to say, but ultimately, yeah, like, if, if YouTube goes down on a fire, whatever the hell that means, uh, 
a lot of channels would kind of lose all their stuff, but I don't know if they'd bother redoing it all. I think it's a different story if you're like someone like like nostalgia critics and the current currently in the process of completely moving to a new channel and they have all their stuff archived, of course, but that's because they make weekly videos and it's all completely unique content more or less. But let's plays I mean you can always let's play again. And uh, the extreme example is, of course, streamers who, in many cases, have zero record of their history at all, which is, actually freaks me out a little bit. That <laughs> the idea of being a streamer and just being a streamer is that, like, if you're not currently streaming, it's almost like you don't exist, which is a weird state of being for a weird internet entertainer. Because a lot of these channels don't have archiving YouTube channels or anything for their streams. But, uh, yeah, some people get more attached to their files. I personally would probably just re-record something if I wanted it that badly, or if it somehow got lost. It's that's what happens. But also, you don't really lose content in any reasonable way, unless you like unless something somehow went catastrophically wrong with YouTube, which has never happened in the time that I've been on it. Uh, the only example I could think of maybe is that. Um, at some point, YouTube might become less popular than some other source, and that also is like a, like maybe a better Let's Play website or something. But even there, you can actually re-download stuff from YouTube. It's not the best solution because it it does. Uh, there's some YouTube compression involved there, but it is your your archive still does exist on some level. The one weird exception is that if, if you have a if a if you have a copyright strike on a video, you it actually disables the download button. Uh, but even there, there's you can you could just fire up a you could probably fire up a PC recording software and use a lossless codec and just re like basically watch your own video in full screen and record it in real time, and then just upload that as the video instead. Like they can't keep your videos from you as long as they're still available. And because it's the internet, especially because it's Google, no video is ever gone, ever. Like, I'm pretty sure any video you hit delete on still exists on their servers, because I don't think they ever get rid of content or data for anything they ever touch. <laughs> but even then, like, we're talking about weird pipe dream stuff of, like, this hypothetical situation where you as a internet celebrity or presence or whatever outlast YouTube itself, which is... Such a <laughs> like outside problem to worry about at some point. Cause yeah, I've never I've never lost a single video on any channel for any reason other than uh, I got one DMCA takedown from an indie developer that was really mad, and uh, we got that video back. Cause fuck those guys. And also, I had a, I had a partner that would that deleted a bunch of videos without talking to me. But that's a whole other concern. Because I made a I made a whole post today trying to warn someone not to make a a group channel with somebody when given the option because there's too much there's too much opening for disagreement you can't control. My DMCA takedowns those are scary. So we were asking about archive right archiving that's pretty much exhausted and then tangented on them then. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm good. Yeah, I think you covered all the uh, questions on my list. So I'm, now you know why I'm all good. those old vlogs were twenty minutes long, in response to one comment. <laughs> <laughs> How do you? I mean, I haven't looked. I sh I probably should, and uh, I'll be the first to admit that I probably should. But when it comes to like DMCA takedowns and and copyright claims and everything like that, I mean, like where? I mean, I I know that it's sort of a a, a moving line as far as like what's acceptable and what isn't and everything else like that. And I know that like when you do a let's play of a game, you should check with the developer and see if they've got stipulations on it. And there's a couple of websites that I found that sort of give you the, the spark notes version of it and basically say, yes, you can No, you can't uh, things like that. And whatever you have to sort of give to sort of make that happen. But how do you handle uh, copyright claims or uh, YouTube automatically saying, Hey, this is copywritten and they sort of give you a strike or they take it down or, or whatever, like, how do you handle that kind of thing? Like, what's what's the best sort of uh, action to do with it? Whenever there's a uh, a content ID match, the automated system, mm -hmm. if it's a legitimate match, like, I look at it, I'm like, yep, that song is in that game. You got it. <laughs> uh, I just move on, ignore it. It doesn't have a negative impact on your channel. It just takes the ad revenue from that video from you. But I make enough content that one video is such a small impact overall that I just don't need to worry about it because 
getting in a legitimate feud uh, feud with someone over that kind of stuff doesn't really work out. Uh, mm -hmm. If you if you are su if you're suspect about the claim, you can actually try to Google the person or company that claims to own the thing. And oftentimes, in some cases, like I did with a Metal Gear Solid video, uh, someone copyright claimed like all the intro cinematics to Metal Gear Solid Five, and I looked up this person because I'm like, that's not Konami. Like mm -hmm. the most recent episode I put up involving Quiet, like that was a Konami. That was Konami content ID. I'm like, okay, well, obviously that's yours. That's fine, but. The intro cutscenes were copyrighted by someone completely different. I googled them. I got a Yahoo Answers page with 17 other people all talking about the same person. That's just absolutely fraudulent. I think they were even like claiming stuff over a whole bunch of different games that weren't even slightly related and also don't seem to be a real company. So I just disputed that and like an hour later the Content ID match was gone because the moment you challenge these fake people it just disappears. Like they just give mm. up immediately because it's not worth it because they, they don't own it. <laughs> they, they're, they're making yeah. fraudulent claims because they like upload something to their channel so they can pretend that it's theirs, but they're really just one of the first people to upload it from someone else's source. Uh, as far as DMCA takedowns, that those are real nasty because they hurt your channel really poorly. They basically make it so you can't upload any sort of long video. I think you lose thumbnails and monetization and the ability to stream and your channel's basically practically disabled for a while. Like you can still upload videos, but all your features are practically gone. Because it's, a, it's a, that's a, a strike, which is a really big deal. Uh, a lot of channels deal with these from time to time, especially critical ones. People that t play someone's stuff and that that person's probably going to get mad at them if the thing's not good. Because a lot of there's a lot of really incompetent video game developers out there that make really terrible indie games, but are either willfully ignorant of their own incompetence or they're just thinking that if they're confident enough in their hate, like in their arguments against this stuff that they can just pretend that they're actually good developers. And even though they know what they did, like this is your guys of the wolf or your day one Gary's incident or slaughter grounds, or in our case, uh, smash a seal an Xbox live indie game full of amazingly low quality, two dimensional images where you basically play what's the equivalent of whack-a-mole where you're hitting seals. And that was the whole game. And it looked terrible, and it played terrible, and there was also nothing to it. And they were real mad at us for not liking it on our show where we mostly shit on Xbox Live Indie Games. I, I, thought, I thought that was really funny, by the way, because my, my uh, partner was way more vulgar than I usually was and would actually sometimes tell developers to kill themselves and say really terrible things. None of those people are what gave us the DMCA takedown. The person that gave it to us was this channel... It was the Smash Seal game where it's like, we mostly were just like, what is this shit? And it was like, this is kind of awful. And then we said a few things and then we just kind of moved on. It was like, we, it was the immediately forgotten about game. And they were the ones that were so mad as to try to destroy our channel for it. Uh, you can dispute that stuff. Uh, there's like warnings that uh, like it could go to court and stuff like that. I don't think any indie developer has ever taken anyone to court for any of these videos and they pretty much all end in these videos just going back up ultimately because I'm pretty sure what happens is the moment you dispute it they essentially have a time limit to proceed and otherwise nothing otherwise it just reverts back to you and you get your video back after a while um the more insidious shit that can happen is basically stuff like I believe when Sega had a new game coming out they tried they basically ended up getting a bunch of accounts banned just for having put up videos for the previous game in the series because it was going to interfere with search results for their new thing and like that's the reason why you might hear like total biscuit saying they'll, he'll never cover anything from sega and stuff like that because there's a few AAA developers that have totally poisoned the well for some people and those are hard to deal with because they're not there's not a pattern for them like they're not even using the the system the way it's supposed to be used they're not taking down videos that are breaking any rules they're specifically just doing nefarious things for the purposes of really shitty uh bottom line reasons right yeah but ultimately yeah like there's not there's not a lot you can do about trying to figure out copyright stuff there's the basic steps people make are usually just to obviously when you play a game like fallout 3 turn off the radio so it's not playing uh 40s classics for the entire 40 hour adventure and uh 
if the if like every other AAA game has a musical opening nowadays that you probably want to replace with say uh royalty free music from YouTube or what I usually do is I replace it with uh background music from some other game that I know never gets any sort of copyright matches like my go-to games are Deadly Premonition and uh Demon Souls because it's stuff that people aren't you are often not super overexposed to but there's enough music in those games that I could find something to fit the scene and I that, since I've already played them both on one channel or another, I know that they don't get any sort of co content ID matches. But uh, yeah, just don't don't up, don't make my mistake of uploading a Frank Sinatra song in your Batman video, because you d maybe didn't grow up with Frank Sinatra and don't know that it's a Frank Sinatra song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, more. This is a very very specific question. Did you do a Life is Strange? I think you did a Life is Strange. Yeah. Uh, let's play. Yeah, I've done did, the first four ever... episodes. Yeah, did they ever strike you for the opening scene? Yes. Uh, for that? They did, okay. Uh, you get... Basically, every time a song plays in Life is, is Strange, like one that's a clear, like, no one's talking right now and a song's playing while we ride a bus or some bullshit along the beach, like, those are always rife for content matches. Same thing goes for the musical openings of every chapter of Tales from the Borderlands, which all have some rock song playing because they're trying to... They're trying to stick with their Cage the Elephant tradition from the first game of having a musical intro for the title card in every episode, and those will all get those will all get uh, matches. They've never led to a strike or anything like that. It's always just been like this: this video has its uh, its uh, monetization disabled, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine by me. I'm just more worried about getting strikes and and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, uh, monetization. Uh, is my understanding my is strikes are not automated. Okay. If you get a strike on your channel, it's because someone went after you, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's especially hard. To, it's especially not something to worry about usually when you're a smaller channel, unless you sp unless you piss off a someone who makes a game about smashing seals who has a lot of time on their hands and is very <laughs> mad at, at very small people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's basically it for for my questions that I've got for you. All right. Um, at this point, I really do appreciate you taking the time uh, to sort of meet with us and, and talk with us and everything. Uh, you know, it means a lot to to somebody that's sort of starting out and everything. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time out. And again, I apologize for coming in late. It's just you know, life. Oh, it's totally fine. It's just we're all, I think we're all busy in our own ways, and we just need to figure yeah. out when when to do things. So I just sort of pulled the trigger on starting the recording because that's like I sure. got things to do. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I mean, I would have done the same thing, and you know, I totally get it. So I'm no hard feelings or anything like that. So yeah, I figured uh, it'd be good to do this because I just you get people asking about how to do YouTube and stuff like that and things like and it's impossible to answer all the questions. That's what the subreddit tries to do for so long, but uh. And yeah, like people who are watching this, maybe check out uh, reddit.com slash uh, let's play to mixed results. Uh, please, if you have a question before going there, search the subreddit for the question to see if it's been asked tw uh, 20 times before, because it oftentimes has. Uh, but that's a place to go to if you have questions we didn't talk about in this video and you want to get them answered, because they've probably been answered somewhere already, actually. In fact, that subreddit probably is currently more useful as an archive of old questions than it is as a place to ask questions now because the current uh the current people that are that will f that frequent that site including me to some extent are kind of sick of the same questions all the time but it's a resource for sure uh it's it's definitely hard to cover everything we covered a lot though that's for sure and i wanted to make a video out of it just because uh these questions will keep happening either way direct directed at me so it, it makes it makes sense to try to make sort of an archive i can re reference to because that this way we can instead of answering everyone's questions individually i can make a more universal answer answer for everyone and probably help a lot more people because people were really psyched about when i made the video about how i edit which people watch that don't let, let's play which is weird to me they watched yeah, the 40 that video <laughs> people people watched a 40 minute editing video that don't edit i don't <laughs> Internet's weird, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. by the way, everyone, thanks for my last uh, Q&A video I did, which I meant to do another one by now already, but this one's kind of that, I guess. Uh, I talked about likes and why they're important, and that is, I got a pop-up on my dashboard saying that's the most liked video in the first two days in the last six months of my channel. 
<laughs> That's awesome. F funny correlation there. I wonder what caused that. But anyway, guys, thanks for watching and thanks to you guys for coming by. I hope that I answered as many questions as possible and uh, maybe someday we'll do a follow-up video, but uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> We've definitely covered a lot. If if someone presented to me with a lot of uh, Let's Play related questions that we haven't answered yet, I might dedicate a video to that. But this should be good for now. And uh, I think that's it. All right. Appreciate your time, Keith. Mm -hmm. Good luck on your guys' channels. Oh.